Good morning. This is our first lecture in the video mode for the second semester students. And this pertains to the course EMB23 Women's Writing. Today we will be talking on a particular issue of women's writing, namely sexuality in women's novels. And in the module which is composed of Uponibesh and Sita's cars, we have the primary focus set in the, our lesson plan on women and sexuality in women's writing in English. Fortunately, both the writers who are included in the syllabus are Indian writers in English, which would make the analysis all the more resourceful and complex. First, let us recapitulate a few ideas which you might have learned in your first semester course in body studies. We talked about the mind-body dichotomy in which the mind has a cognitive superiority on the body in the sense that the mind can reflect on the body but the body doesn't have a mind of its own. So in the cognitive plane, the mind is superior and the body is inferior to the mind. There is no problem with this philosophical binary. But when this philosophical binary comes to attack our real life as political binaries, then the problems start jeopardizing the senses of equality, neutrality, harmony and peace in all sectors of society. Because the white man is reserved in the prestigious throne of mind, while the black man is often relegated as ugly black body. The upper class has sophisticated and refined educated mind to ponder about philosophical inquiries, but the uncultured proletariat is a lumpen body, ugly, sweating, working class body. The man has the capacity of disembodied philosophizing, but the woman is equated to the sexualized and childbearing body. So, in several real practices of real society, the philosophical dichotomy between mind and body is actually being practiced as center, periphery, or superior, inferior binary. So the philosophical binary has become a kind of political binary. And in this political binary, how are women negotiating with their equatedness with the body? How are women who are writing a novel which is a mental and cognitive artistic practice a priori, per se, will see their art as also pertaining to the femaleness of their body. How do women writers talk about the body? How should they address the body? Because the masculine writers already address the woman as a body and body as something feminine. So these are the questions that the women writers have to tackle while they are actually engaged in a creative pursuit and these are the questions which we will have to tackle when we are reading and writing about, learning about, being schooled about, being examined about women's writings in India. The author of Upanivesh, a novel which is there in that module, Sarojini Sahu was born in the 1950s, probably 1956. And she has been enlisted among the 25 most exceptional women of India by the Kindle magazine of Kolkata. She has been given the Orisha Sahitya Academy Award in the year 1993. In the novel Pratibandi, we find that we have a very unusual type of dealing of the theme of sexual relationship or romantic heterosexual relationship between a woman and a man told from a woman's point of view. Because here we have the protagonist called Prakriti who is finding herself confined in a remote hamlet and in that remote hamlet she feels alienated and claustrophobic. So she is looking for, desperately trying to reach out toward and searching for love. But she doesn't find any particular encouragement to her pursuit of love in that claustrophobic atmosphere in the remote Indian hamlet. Finally, she falls in love with a local MLA or member of legislative assembly. He is 
kind of a seasoned politician. But in spite of being a seasoned politician, there is deep inside him a knowledge seeker. He is interested about archaeology and archaeological findings. Through love, through sexuality, through encouragement that a woman can give to a man while in relationship with him. Our protagonist, our heroine so to say, changes the politician's essence from that of a third world politician to a knowledge seeker. Now here we have a very very subtle dismantling of a mythic and stereotypical binary opposition between mind and the body. Because stereotypically speaking, sexuality should be antagonistic to the pursuit of knowledge. Spiritual rekindling of inquisitivity, of epistemological urge within a human being is directly contradictory to his lust, to his loins. But this stereotype is broken. The woman who is equated to body and body which is equated to the binary opposite of mind and sexuality which is an activity which is supposed to be the opposite word of knowledge is actually working as a positive catalyst of knowledge in this novel. In Gambhiri Ghara we have the parameter of private sexuality and international relations in the public domain crisscrossing each other just kind of dismantling our firm conviction that sexuality is something which is so private, so private that it should be behind the closed doors and if possible it should be enclosed within the closet. But here sexuality takes place online in the virtual space across the borders between an Indian housewife called Cookie and a Pakistani non-stereotypical Muslim called Safik. Safik doesn't believe in the fanatic values that his country is so ardently favoring at times of fanaticization and regimentalization of the entire population. Cookie is initially very very skeptical about sexuality. In the online chat, which initially is something like a wheat combat that reminds us of restoration comedy of manners, Cookie is very angry. She is arrogant whenever asked questions about her sexuality. And Rafiq is a very, very seasoned man, seasoned in sexuality and sexual exploration, just like he is seasoned in other types of liberal pursuits. Safik asks Cookie, has she ever indulged in sexual process? Does she have any knowledge of sexual pleasure? Cookie is very, very offended by such queries and Cookie suggests that lust or sexuality and love or spirituality are not the same thing. Interestingly, Cookie and Safik, they fall in love and they indulge in online chatting. And although the chatting is some kind of a sex chat, it's also a very, very spiritual communion or spiritual communication between two progressive souls. So the novel uses the online discussion format, online chat format for a very, very bold person. In Uponibesh, there is a kind of um, satirical dismantling of the stereotypes related to the third world woman's expected normative sexual behavior or rather let's say the lack of it here we have a bohemian protagonist called medha her naming as medha is interesting because medha means intellection in that nomenclature there is a subtle irony and medha is a kind of experimental pursuer of life as a journey. Medha initially thinks it would be very boring to be a married woman because in married life how can a girl stick to a single 
men without feeling monotonous, without feeling. Once Sahu was asked the question, when and why and how did you come to the exploration of feminine and female sexuality as a theme or as a possible plot for your writings? And uh, what uh, factors in your own uh, growing up as a girl into a young woman and then into a mature woman uh, could have been uh, possibly the engaging factors in you becoming a novelist of sexuality or especially woman sexuality. And Sahu uh, uh, clearly without any kind of hesitation said that in a childhood maybe when I was growing up as a young girl, my father used to encourage me to wear the dresses of both the genders so that I am not molded into a particular gender role, but I understand about the broader aspects of human personality and the broader aspects of the zones of gender neutrality. For example, sexuality is a zone in which the man and the woman would both participate with equal eagerness and would both seek for pleasure and would both seek for harmony and would both seek for meaningfulness. So maybe being dressed up as a boy from the childhood was uh, some kind of a psychological schooling that negated the typical third world patriarchal schooling of girls into typically feminine roles and feminine dresses. Once in a foreign conference probably, Sahu was asked this question by an international philosopher. Did your childhood practice of cross-dressing encourage you to be bold enough to be articulate about sexuality of a woman? And Sahu explains in an interview that maybe that singular practice was not the decisive factor. But what was the decisive factor was the possibility that without any kind of obscenity, with the curiosity of an all its seeker, without any kind of offensive discourses towards women's body, without leering at women's sexuality, philosophy can address the question of women's sexuality. In India, nobody asks questions like that to a woman. But in the international conference, being confronted with such a question in a very, very amiable and harmonious manner, Sahu was ignited to explore the possibilities of questioning sexuality through knowledge and art.